Hi, well, welcome back. I think we've still got a few people coming in. So if... I'm just going to start out, uh, so this is the panel discussion part of this event, and I'm just going to start by reading out a few tweets that have been firing as we've been debating and talking and getting ready for this debate. Uh, firstly, uh, the happy name Armpit McGee, <laughs> aka Giles Fagan, who is the event manager here at Status, in the book, very inspiring. Um, Nicholas Lovell, just heard that the book selling 40,000 copies in one country was impressive. We'll be, we'll be debating that later tonight. Book Trust, who I work for. Uh, fascinating debate at Sessions Hall, uh, listening to charismatic Mike Head from Pirini Press. There you are. And one more. Uh, let's see. Okay. Samuel Partridge. Is Samuel Partridge in the room? Okay. Structure sounds similar to city. In city to UCL, we have more bearded lecturers, however. <laughs> <laughs> this is a beauty of Twitter. Right, we're going to move on to the stand up or put our hand up. Uh, Claire, if you could pass the microphone to Russian. And you get to ask your question. My question is just in the future, will all publishing businesses be technology businesses? Nicholas <laughs> Love. Yes. Well, <laughs> it, the content, I actually think that all businesses will be technology businesses, not just publishing. Um, anytime you're sharing ideas, they are easier to share digitally. Um, not only that, but anytime you're trying to reach customers, they will be easier to reach uh, digitally. Not exclusively digitally, but that way. So for me, a publishing business in the future finds a way to share its content digitally and finds a way to find its customers, but then sells something to them physically. I don't think the physical is over. I just don't think that the mass market will be physical. It will be the niche people who love what we do who will pay a premium for the content. Which um, I think is at least quite impressive and very good pay to me. Okay. Well, uh, well, leading on from this uh, one, Amanda, would you like to? I'm afraid I completely agree with that, so that's not really a question. No. <laughs> Let's have a The question actually was um, will they be technology businesses? And, and actually, of course, they are technology businesses now. It's just that the technology is changing into digital technology. And I think what's happening is people buy differently when they're buying online. They buy quickly, they read differently. But the, the same core requirements of any published product will be just the same. So we'll have to convince them faster of the quality of the brand. And, and because there'll be so much information available, we'll need to guide them more carefully to, to what's available. So it, it's still a technology business. Mary -Anne. I just wanted to stand for a broader definition of technology um, because the publishing has always been a technology business and you know, think back to the stationers and their quills and pens. Um, I, that might sound crazy, but in my publishing career, and I'm not that old, guys, um, I have seen hot metal through to where we are now and it, it's changed incredibly quickly. The, the technology change I wanted to, to table, though, is, is ways of working and it comes back to the globalisation theme. Because um, uh, Routledge, for example, and Stable, they now have commissioning editors in Singapore, New York, and Dickert working together as a team, a commissioning team. Wiley, they have they centralise all their textbook management, and they all answer to Chichester, and they have virtual meetings constantly. Um, that's just work, ways of working and being, and being global. But the, the technology and the printing thing is extraordinary, and the history of it's actually fascinating. Um, so, I was being told not that long ago um, that in 1996, now most of you were alive in 1996, um, 1996 it cost, um, it cost, ooh, um, ooh, what was it, £100,000, uh, £1,000, I'm sorry, and it took three months to get a gig of memory on a special thing in the States to produce a database. That's 1996, we're not talking about 1896, this is so recent. So, the, the, please just, just think about that and the fact that technology broadly to the telephone. Well, can I dig in again and just say that um, I, uh, I've got a designer on my books who I've never met. I've got an editorial assistant who works on the blog who I've met once. I have two different freelance editors on my other books. Um, those, those two I know. But I'm working with four or five different people for a specific task which they're really good at. And I'm not particularly designing because it's the blog book for the professional work. Um, those people are easy to find through the web. I can work with them through the web. 
is cost effective for both of us. Um, and I'm not paying them like rubbish wages, it's just that it's much easier to work in that way. So I think the changes to the working practice are absolutely critical. Okay, great. We're going to phone that on. Is Patrick Belton here? Yes. Hello, Corey Belton. I'm a German Um Amazon.com, and it's, it's affiliates, has annual revenues greater than every book seller in the US and the UK. I was wondering if the, if the people here at the book trade could be drawn on its positive and negative repercussions. Right, so the question is about Amazon being the biggest distributor. Uh, positive and negative. Uh, Michael. Um, I went to an international editors conference in Helsinki this summer and I sat at one dinner next to a, a publisher who had set up also his own publishing house three years ago. But he comes from a very old established uh, publishing family in Helsinki and before was running one of the biggest publishing houses there. And I asked him what has, he, what has been his major learning curve. Uh, over the last three years since he set up his own little house, which actually isn't that much bigger than Kyrene. I think they are putting out about eight to ten books a year. So they're doing a similar thing, um, emphasis on quality rather than quantity, on curation, on bespokeness. Um, now what he said was the biggest learning curve or discovery for him was that books actually don't necessarily sell, but that doesn't mean you can't make money with them. And what it means is that for a small publishing house like Pyrene, um, yes, our, of course our books are on Amazon, however, we have to sell them for such a great, dis to such a great discount um, that of course they'd only make money for us if we were <coughs> shifting huge amounts. Now, that I think uh, is for a business model highly unlikely for Pyrene. What, however, <coughs> is much better is, let's say we sell 100 books by Amazon, uh, if I manage to sell, if we manage to sell five or ten books um, through our store, our booming store, we get the same amount of money. And that's really, I think, for example, also the same as with subscription. Uh, so for Amazon, for us, Amazon is a marketing tool, a publicity tool. It's great to have the Amazon books up there if somebody wants it to, to get there. Do it. However, can I also just say, Amazon actually is not necessarily cheaper than ordering through our uh, website directly. Um, and in fact, for next year onwards, uh, it will be even probably more expensive unless they run special deals. Because our books will go up to £10, um, and therefore Amazon discounts you will probably meet at £7, uh, while we have our you know, online subscriptions for £25, three books, free posters and packages. So, um, okay. I don't know if that answers your question or not. It's a great answer. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, yeah, so there's a couple of things I'd like to say about this. The first is that it's very hard to um, explain the internet as anything other than the friends to the consumer. Um, and it's very hard to explain the internet as anything other than the friends to the consumer. Because the moment you see something you like, you can see what it's costing in lots of other places. And it's very hard to explain the internet as anything other than the friends to the consumer. Because the moment you see something you like, you can see what it's costing in lots of other places. And I'm sure you've all heard the term friendly. Have you heard of that? For Amazon, in that they're part friend and part enemy. But because there's this constant emphasis on offering you the thing you want at the cheapest possible price, we need to think about the long term consequences of that. Because um, ultimately, if something's going to be paid for, there has to be an investment in the quality. And I think what publishers need to do is, is to do what Actually, I don't really aren't any spies from Tesco's here, but they, they build this sense of them being the consumer's friend, and they're terribly good, and they're terribly sort of every little helps, but actually they're a massive organisation. And I think what publishers need to do is to build a sense of your moral obligation to buy from individual publishing houses and help them invest in new writers, and new writers that you will want to read in the future, and to create the sort of, the sort of movement that's promoting slow towns and real meat and the revival of knitting, you know, these, these things that make you feel good because you're accessing something that makes you, fe feeds you in a sort of nurturing sense inside as opposed to just, just things you don't really want to read. But I think publishers have got their work to cut out to make people feel that they want to return and buy from that place which has created something that they've enjoyed in the past. Amazon won't do it. Um, so, so two things. Um, the first is that Amazon is the only thing that's going to stop us from the tyranny of Apple. So that makes it sound good. Uh, the, the, the Kindle fire is good. Um, on the other hand, um, uh, they're pretty close to monopoly, and monopolies are bad, so that's bad. Um, the, the future is about controlling the direct relationship to your customer. 
So as long as you don't let Amazon be the only person who talks to your customer and not you, they're fine. If you let them do that, you're right. Okay. Now, <coughs> well, obviously one doesn't um, want to talk about one, one of one's very largest customers over the, um, in any negative way. Is, is anyone from Amazon here? <laughs> <laughs> no boats in the room, keep going. Um, the other interesting thing is that the, the, the person who actually had my job as MD in five and before me is now MD of Amazon UK. Um, so I just share that with you. And also, it's, it's not politic or in fact legal to talk about their pricing and all that sort of stuff. So I would do that. So what I will say is I would really say that anybody in this room should take a look at how they do it, which is to your point, learn from Amazon. Um, and that would be my absolute, they are, you might disagree, you might think that actually, frankly, the website needs an update, the recommendations are usually rubbish and all that kind of stuff. That's fine. They know about customer care like they own the customer like nobody else. And in the future, that's what we need to know. We need to know about our customers. We need to know what they want. We need to know when they're ready to get up in the morning. We need to know how to price our books to them. We need to know everything. So one can paint them, and of course there are many debates, which I don't want to get involved in at the moment, about bad or good, and should they be a publisher, or should they be this, or that. Let's not debate that. Just learn from them. And I, and I think, which was my point earlier about learn about 